Welcome to another episode of The Edge presented by The Bluntness. I'm your host, Gregory Fry, executive editor over at The Bluntness. And today we have a very special guest, Amy Dennison, co-founder of the Cannabis Media Council. We're so glad you could join us. Amy, how are you today? Excellent. Excellent. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for the warm welcome. And I'm excited to, to chat with you today. Yeah. And hey, before we get into the discussion, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Thanks so much for the opportunity. I am Amy Dennison, co-founder of the Cannabis Media Council. And the Cannabis Media Council really came together a couple of years ago in the idea formation when my co-founder, Joyce Sonali, uh, reached out. And at the time, you know, she was looking at quite a few investor decks and looking to seed this industry um, out in California and noticed that there was a consistency within people looking to raise funds and that all of their marketing was really going to educating, driving consumer consideration uh, and reducing stigma and normalizing use. And so she asked me, you know, could we create a, a national advertising campaign, <clears throat> excuse me, that would uplift the entire category? And I said, yes, the short answer, we can do this. The longer answer is how do we create you know, a council or how do we create something that will have the most impact for the industry starting now and moving forward? And so at the time, my background uh, was first in uh, advertising, um, 20 years history in traditional media uh, focused on the paid part of the marketing mix. Uh, but then I was at Curaleaf uh, and building the New York market uh, and responsible for, for really in that medical, early medical days, um, you know, reaching patients uh, and helping and welcoming them to the, into the dispensaries. And so with that experience, saw that of all of the marketing challenges, one of the biggest and most underrepresented parts of the marketing mix was paid media. And so from there, started my own advertising agency called Fino uh, that was specifically focused on cannabinoids uh, advertising as a brand business or a revolution because we still need to legalize. And so from this, this triangulation, this, you know, this coming together, the Cannabis Media Council uh, came and started with the mission to deprogram the war on plants. And to do that, we are going to break the and end the mainstream moratorium on advertising and cannabis. So that's as we set out uh, to do and recently launched the Cannabis Media Council officially uh, at the Clio Awards. And we'll be excited to chat with you a little bit more about the Cannabis Media Council and our aims going forward. Nice. Excellent. You actually answered my, my two first questions with that. And, and you know, so... You mentioned that the you know one of the aims is is sort of breaking these barriers between cannabis and uh, paid advertising, mainstream advertising, mainstream marketing. Uh, I wonder, and I wonder if you could just sort of. I think there's more to it than that, mm -hmm. but I wonder if you could sort of just unpack mm -hmm. that piece for a minute to to get a better idea of what you guys have in mind. Definitely. So with paid media as a as a exercise, the reason why people do advertising is one, that they can reach people that don't yet know them. There's other parts of the marketing mix that are within your, your spheres of influence um, and within you know one or two degrees separation of inviting people that you know uh, to invite people that they know to come into your network. But advertising really serves as the opportunity to reach um, people completely outside of your outside of your networks. And so the reason why people do that is one, to connect with uh, people that, are, that don't yet know that they don't know you um, or aren't yet considering what you hope they consider. And so that's the origin of why you use this tactic. And then the second you know, thing to think about with advertising is that it's strictly, trans it's strictly transactional. Um, and so it's the idea that you can pay to play uh, to amplify your message as you'd like it to be uh, received. 
in, in particular markets at scale. And that's why advertising is effective and works. Uh, it helps to uh, stay top of mind and also to uh, put out very specific messages uh, repeatedly um, so that people can remember them and you can also continue to like lay down memory uh, with people. And so I'm thinking about advertising and why it's important to reach mainstream audiences is that cannabis is now mainstream. It's in the majority of the states in the U.S. in some capacity, and people still uh, are suffering under the stigma and that it's not a not normalized um, form of, of wellness, enjoyment, uh, medicine. And so in thinking about how do we use the, the, the incredible mechanism that is advertising to help spread some of these messages of normalization, destigmatization on behalf of the category as a whole. And so in thinking about the challenges of paid media, uh, many of the, of the known advertisers, uh, and we've all you know, been lamenting uh, the embargo and the moratorium and being shut down and, and all of this and censorship, uh, but on the publisher side of it, it's, they're worried about um, losing their licenses based on federal uh, legal, you know, lack of legalization um, of, of the plant. And so that's the primary concern. However, um, there are more and more publisher partners that are coming online. And so it is a flat myth that you cannot advertise in cannabis. That's just untrue. Um, there's plenty of places to advertise. And so it was important to us um, at the jump, um, as we launched the Cannabis Media Council, to partner with a major mainstream uh, publisher. And that's where our partnership with Hearst came into play. And so for, the, for our origin, it was important for us to say, yes, uh, there has been a history with Hearst um, and the cannabis industry, and they are fully acknowledging that they've gotten it wrong, um, as many people have gotten it very wrong about this plant. But as a business and as a company now, they want to get it right. And so that is the absolute heart of the Cannabis Media Council and the messaging that we want to put out, that while there's been massive stigma and myths and a mess around this plant, the, the reality is, is that now we have a chance to get it very right. And Hearst is like number four media company in the world. And so being able to reach uh, consumers on trusted and beloved publications and also uh, throughout uh, the U.S. and at scale is an incredible opportunity for us to write the messages um, that have been, you know, percolating for um, and propagating for for decades at this point. Man, so many things I want to follow up on there. Um, real quick, though, maybe we could get hers to print their their paper publications using hemp paper. I will certainly ask. That's a huge story. That I mean, that that could be a huge thing right there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's such an opportunity to have to be an industrial material. It is. Oh man, it's how we'll save the planet. Agreed. But man, I, don't we could talk the whole episode about that. Mm -hmm. But I, I I think one thing to I think we ought to touch upon here is that when you talk about advertising, I, it's it's more than just using, uh, you know, mainstream technologies to, uh, for cannabis brands to push their products. It's about using these technologies to uh, get the, the right storytelling out there um, in terms of addressing, I think, a lot of the different plot holes across the industry, which uh, the Cannabis Media Council has outlined as their guiding principles whether it's safe access, uh, encouraging regenerative uh, agriculture, um, countering misconceptions, uh, supporting federal legalization, so many different plot holes there. And I, the need to be addressed with uh, impeccable storytelling. And, and I wonder, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot to tackle. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a very it's a very much a multifaceted focus, and I wonder what your thoughts are on on, on just so many different um, issues out there. Where do you even start? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and it's something that we gave 
quite a bit of consideration because there's incredible work that's happening on the policy level, um, on the patient level, and those messages are super important and necessary. And the Cannabis Media Council uh, will be partnering with organizations that have incredible messages, um, but may not have the media arm. Uh, and so look for that from the Cannabis Media Council. And also we welcome organizations who are changing hearts and minds of the poll, are talking directly to uh, policymakers, who are educating practitioners and physicians on how to recommend medical cannabis for their patients. We're highlighting patient stories. All of those excellent campaigns uh, that have been um, in play and also uh, effective uh, to date, we welcome those organizations uh, who may need a media partner uh, to, to, to help execute campaigns on that behalf. So that's, that's the first thing is that there's an opportunity for a partnership. But for the Media Council, we decided uh, that we wanted to focus on driving consumer consideration through lighthearted um, and completely normal everyday uh, uh, interactions with the plant. Um, and so with that, our creative lead of the, of the, of the founding board, Allison Disney, who is an award-winning agency uh, for receptor brands, an absolutely incredible team has come on to start developing. We have two campaigns that we have teed up for this fall. Um, and both campaigns you know, really go to the heart of you know, considering consumption in legal states. Um, and the you know, a little bit of a teaser of how do we start to then even think about um, connecting with consumers is that the data shows us that even in legal states of adult use or medical, that the baby boomer, boomer generation continues to lag in terms of being the kind of the last uh, consumers to uh, to start to engage with regulated cannabis uh, businesses and brands. And so we developed our first connection and outreach to be specifically focused on reaching our boomers uh, to think about and consume and consume uh, to think about and consider uh, cannabis. Uh, there will be other um, segments that we very much start to think about in terms of a consumer base. Um, there's certainly lots of conversations and evolution going on in sports conversation. We also have in, within audiences certainly want to um, uplift our can of moms um, and mothers who you know are looking for alternatives for wellness, but you know are have, have really significant concerns about um, mothering uh, and and how that how they're perceived. And so the creative is going to be very much focused. Um, on those consumers, and just to name a couple, um, but also with that, uh, you know, taking some of the heaviness, you know, out of this industry and letting it be uh, a little bit lighter um, is is a goal for us, and we think that humor uh, is a way uh, to storytell um, around this plant that is both accurate but also um, engaging. Yeah, that's interesting that we. I want to ask you about the humor piece, but I also, I want to mention that it was, it was storytelling like this that brought me into the cannabis industry seven years ago when this little startup called Green Flower uh, published a, a video campaign called Coming Out Green, the series of a somewhat heavy, uh, you know, emotionally driven black and white videos of, of everyday people sharing their cannabis story and how cannabis has impacted their life. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that, that sucked me in as soon as I saw that. And it seems like, yeah, the, the, I think the cannabis industry has struggled with storytelling in that regard. I'm seeing more of it now, like, you know, telling these stories uh, of the ev everyday consumer rather than focusing on, on the, you know, the stoner culture, which is fine, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, cannabis is obviously bigger than that. And so I, I wonder I guess where I'm going with all of this is I, I wonder if you if you agree that cannabis has has sort of fumbled the storytelling in a way, um, and, and and yeah, I don't know where I was going with that question, but it's it's you know it's it's all coming back to storytelling. Yes, and so I think there's there's been two major things that have been you know part of the storytelling around cannabis. 
is one with regulations. Um, and so with regulations and you know, what can you say in terms of claims um, is a real thing once you start getting into amplification. It's one thing to share it you know, personally you know, over a cup of coffee um, with loved ones. It's another thing when you start you know, being within the, the networks and the frameworks of amplification, whether that's through you know, the, our earned media, thinking you know, the, the PR and the influencer and the social media, but then also you know, with paid media, um, you're now entering into other people's networks um, and you know what they can be, you know what what their consumer base and customer base and audiences are expecting, what their other advertisers um, and brands you know consider to be guardrails around brand brand safety, and then also you know thinking about any type of licensing that they might be concerned about or you know status on platforms that may or may not be open to the conversation. And so I think it's I think it's worth acknowledging that that much of much of our relationship with the plant and um, with the cannabis has, industry has been very personal. Um, and, I, and I do hear this over and over and over again, how many people had a very personal um, experience with a loved one or, uh, or someone in their, in their world that you know, had a, a life-changing effect with cannabis. Um, and it's with that that are you know, driving people to find a way to move legalization forward. And so I agree with you, one, that so much of this is a, is a one-to-one conversation of people considering this uh, plan, considering these products. Um, but then also, you know, how do we tell those stories in a compliant and a factual way has been a real thing. Um, and so in thinking about how do we tell these stories, you know, without running afoul of, you know, of, uh, of, you know, of making too many claims, you know, and being held responsible, responsible for them in some way is of course to do more research, right? And so when we talk about descheduling the plant, um, this is what we're talking about in order to open up opportunities to research and actually have peer reviewed clinical researched papers that start to substantiate uh, some of these um, conditions and effects that people have been sharing for generations um, for how this, how these products and how this medicine has helped them. And so one way to start to tell a more clear story um, is to is to add research to it. The second thing is to think about um, and set guidelines that the bluntness is doing, that so many cannabis publications are doing to say, this is how we talk about it. Um, and I think that we've seen really good evolution um, for how we do that. Uh, but then also uh, it's a continued effort uh, to just keep telling the stories that we were, you know, that we, that we share with one another uh, freely. And, you know, with all of the words, I mean, the, for example, it, um, you know, the idea of having of being able to specifically you know say the word cannabis um, and how that's a just basically on every block list um, within you know digital media on all the major platforms is is something to to really acknowledge as a key lever um, that if we can you know speak very clearly about you know what we're talking about and drive people to sites for more information or to collectives for more information. That'll be a first, you know, major step for us to allow to for allow ourselves to keep talking about it on in a one to one basis, but then in a one to many basis. I wonder if you could talk a little more about the some of the uh partnership ideas or, or possibilities that you have in mind. You mentioned like Hearst earlier and I wonder what else comes to mind there. Definitely. I would love to, you know, share that I've had a great working history with iHeartMedia. Uh, and iHeartMedia continues to evolve uh, their stance on uh, the different cannabinoids and the different ways to reach people through audio. Uh, we know that podcasts and radio are a really effective way to reach people across the country. Uh, and so are looking to develop, you know, in, in addition to a partnership, uh, with iHeartMedia, also thinking about the many forms of advertising, uh, whether it's an audio uh, commercial, uh, which can be you know, very, very engaging, uh, reaching people uh, where they are uh, in you know, listening to their favorite uh, podcasts or radio stations, 
um, across the country. And I'm notably thinking, you know, some of our more rural areas uh, that very much t- uh, trust their local radio stations uh, and has been an incredible way to get the word out about, you know, dispensaries near them or legalization efforts near them. And so certainly looking to look at audio as a very effective way. Um, but there's anywhere that we can uh, we can advertise compliantly. Uh, it's the, absolutely the sky is the limit. And by that, the sky, I mean um, funding and sponsorship and partners at this point. Uh, the amazing place that we are with cannabis uh, and as the council, um, because we're leading with a message uh, that's, that's generally um, open uh, to the category, it's allowing publishers to engage with us in a way that you know, they may have been nervous about either having to verify a brand. Um, is this brand legit? Are they, are they real? Um, are, do they have, and then you get into uh, beyond if we trust this brand, then you know, how do we run media that has a call to action um, that leads to a site that's age gated, right? And then is selling you know, cannabis products or not. So without you know, those major concerns, what we're able to do as a council is, is start to engage with a publisher that categorically is open to the space. Um, and the messaging around consider cannabis and within states that are legal, um, or the idea of looking at states that are coming online and how can we, how can we be a advocate for the efforts that are happening in those states that are developing? But in thinking about with the, but in thinking about the, uh, way that we roll these out, um, there's, there's incredible support and excitement around this. And we'll be looking at media partners. Um, who are excited to give in kind um, to similar to, you know, other media partners that have, have you know, blacklisted and also, um, and also categorically rejected cannabis business in the past, start to open their doors. And as we put out fantastic messages uh, that, you know, celebrate creativity, that celebrate cannabis, uh, Hopefully, what we can do is then continue to uh, encourage those publishers and make the business case for them to continue opening it up to then more brands coming, you know, either through the Cannabis Media Council membership network um, or cannabis brands going directly to them looking for that opportunity. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, the council has a the council's plans to to serve cannabis brands, and you mentioned the membership network. I wonder if you could talk more about that. Yes. So when we launched um, with over a hundred brands, uh, we intentionally connected with independent brands, um, and many of them female-owned, queer-owned, and led, um, BIPOC. Uh, so looking at really from the jump a diversity of ownership, and then also of products, uh, and then also national representation. And so we welcomed our brands in to say, you know, first, does this does this resonate with you? Would a campaign that's category wide, so thinking about if we were in a legal state, you know, we would be organizing around a checkoff pro or a legal um, country would be, would be um, looking around at a at a checkoff program, which is super standard for like the dairy industry, and they put out the Got Milk ads. Um, we're thinking about beef; it's what's for dinner. Uh, those are campaigns that are led by the industry as a whole um, to advocate for the category. And so the, the first question to our brands is, you know, would a, would a campaigns that, you know, that endeavor to be the tide that lifts all boats be helpful to you? You know, and it's, it'll be unbranded, you know, all the things that are, you know, that make us amazing and differentiated in the market uh, will be a bit smoothed over. We're not going to have conversations about, you know, sun grown versus, you know, indoor grown. Um, so much of that is still based on regulations and in the state and what you can possibly do. But instead, we're just going to be the collective voice, uh, one that puts out, uh, and that leads by example and puts out um, amazing ways to, to advertise and to do it well and publishers who are open to it and, and doing it well. But then also, um, to 
to keep cannabis as an option top of mind in their markets. And it was a resounding yes, like we're in brands, we're, we're game. And so it's our goal actually uh, to never raise funds or need to raise funds from brands. They have been carrying the torch uh, for decades at this point, depending on which market you're in. And so this is a way for the Cannabis Media Council to say thank you to the brands that did make it their entire marketing budget to educate the, the industry, um, in addition to, you know, doing all of the heroic efforts to get products to, to the people. Um, but then also thinking about how do we connect those brands in a meaningful way to the people and the organizations that are sponsoring and supporting the Cannabis Media Council. And so the primary people um, who have supported the Cannabis Media Council um, have been people who want this to individuals who want this to be part of their legacy of changing hearts and minds and agree with that this is the way to do it. The second group is people who are interested uh, in the category, but um, a bit nervous about, you know, betting on or investing in, in a particular brand um, at the jump. And then the third category is people is organizations within the cannabis space um, that are ancillary providers um, and want to connect with these brands in a meaningful and authentic way. Uh, and so thinking about those three different types of um, support uh, and we welcome support. Uh, we are set up with a fiscal sponsor. So all uh, donations and sponsorships are tax deductible at this point. And we are on a path of applying for a 501c3, but we are set up in a nonprofit model and are very grateful for our fiscal sponsors with SEMA Studios, uh, which allows us to receive tax deductible donations, which in cannabis, you know, there's so little that's tax deductible. Um, it was a, it was a big, uh, it was a big goal for us to, to make it uh, happen. And so in thinking about, you know, how we move forward with those groups, the, the real hope is that brands will not only get a bit of a reprieve um, with some, some air cover uh, of advertising, but then also will be connected with new opportunities uh, for them to develop their own marketing mix. And one note I will say is that marketing as an uh, endeavor within cannabis is still deeply underfunded as we, and we all understand why it's super expensive to, and yeah. you know, whether through legal compliance supply chain to get products to market. But if we compare our marketing spend in cannabis uh, versus, you know, uh, versus retail or CPG, you know, cannabis brands are spending anywhere from kind of five to eight um, percent on their marketing is it in a general statement, whereas retail is is 10 to 25 percent, depending on the maturity of the business. And CPG is, is in a growth environment that we're in also hovers around 12 to 20 percent. And so I think that as we develop more opportunities for marketers to market, um, then there will also be an increased investment in being able to help you know build these brands and scale these businesses. I think 280E has obviously been a big uh, hindrance there as well because cannabis brands can't deduct their marketing expenses yeah. or any of their expenses. Um, well, the last thing I wanted to ask you, um, uh, we're about out of time, but I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned you're talking about the storytelling piece and how a lot of uh, cannabis publications like the bluntness have already been, been doing this. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the potential role for cannabis publications like that in this mainstream facing mission. Yes. I'm so excited that you brought this up. So part of the, part of the goal with the Cannabis Media Council is to put out annual guidelines um, every year. Uh, so next May is when we circle the date uh, to release an annual guideline of how to talk about cannabis, how to, how to advertise cannabis, how to uh, image cannabis. And with those guidelines, the number one source of who's doing this well will be our cannabis publishers who have been against all you know, headwind doing this and doing this so well. And so the role of cannabis publishers um, for us is one, we want to illustrate and show and give you leadership on what you've already accomplished and done so well. Uh, and so in thinking about how we engage uh, with, with you going forward, and we're so thrilled to be part of, of this conversation, 
um, is that we will be looking to highlight and show how, how to do it well. Um, and cannabis publishers will lead and set the example for mainstream publishers who are just starting to figure this out and bring it online. So really excited to have that connection and formalize um, those relationships. Uh, the second way that we would love to do this is that as we engage people with our national campaigns, is that we also want to find ways to direct people to cannabis publications um, who are already doing the good work of, of explaining more about this plan or sharing the stories or answering the questions that pe so many people who are just starting to consider this category need to read. And so we will also be looking for great opportunities to direct people um, from these campaigns to our cannabis publishers uh, for them to continue and uplift uh, their great work. Awesome. Amy, this has been great. I wonder before we go, if there's anything else you'd like to add or, or plug even. I mean, thank you so much for this. And thank you for the good work that you're doing and your leadership. Uh, as noted, uh, we would love and welcome the support uh, for the Cannabis Media Council. All donations are tax deductible and can be processed through our website. And we really welcome uh, people that want to be part of sponsoring uh, this you know, major national campaigns to please reach out to us with your networks, with your recommendations, uh, with your support, uh, so that we can continue growing this uh, from you know the heartbeat of a movement, but into the industry that we want to experience. Excellent. And where where do you want people to find you online? Please uh, visit us at cannabismediacouncil.com. Awesome, Amy. Thank you so much. All right, that wraps up another episode of The Edge. Thank you to our wonderful guest, Amy Dennison, co-founder of the Cannabis Media Council. And thank you to the audience. If you need a little more bluntness in your life, you can find us on social media or thebluntness.com. Until next time, be well and be nice. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the bar, 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 I'm g